so official, folks. Welcome, everybody, to this February 3rd Leaders Agile Austin Special Interest Group. Thanks for joining us. Uh, I'll introduce myself soon. Max from Austin, Texas. Uh, all of you should be able to see my slide. And as we said, we are being recorded. So the cool thing about it, if you don't want to be recorded, turn off your camera, change your name. It will be as, ever, as if you were never here, okay? But we do post all our recordings on our YouTube channel so that we share all this beautiful knowledge with, with everyone. Folks, if you're not aware, this Leader Special Interest Group is part of the Agile Austin organization. It's, an, um, uh, it's a nonprofit that has been around since 2007. And we connect, we collaborate, we grow all things agile. And thanks for being out here, folks. Quick introduction. Max Akesi is my name. I'm, I actually founded this Leader Special Interest Group back in 2010, so we have a tradition going here for like 12 years. Every month we meet. I'm also the Agile Austin president, and my nine-to-five job is IT senior manager at PayPal. So why do we get together every first Friday of the month? And the Leader SIG focuses on people that might have an interest in leading or learn more about how to lead an agile transformation within their team, their organization, or just get exposure to that. We, as I said, we meet every first Friday of the month, we have speaker, we have topics. And I just wanna say that what's interesting about being part of something for a lot of years is that you see a trend. And what I've seen in the leader special interest group is that when we started in 2010, we were talking about training people on how to do scrum, uh, training people on stories, how to create good stories, story point estimation in story points. Oh my goodness, how many sessions we did because there was a lot that was just not known. Fast forward now to a lot more things are mainstream in Agile. A lot more people have learned a lot of things. So we have a lot of topics around other things that are needed for a transformation like psychological safety, better communication, empowering people, like getting beyond all the frameworks and really having to focus on foundational stuff. And I think it's, it's interesting to see where we've come and where we'll be like in another five years when we're talking about leading agile transformations, right? So exciting. Membership and sponsorship, I mean, Everything is on our site, agileaustin.org. We have a phenomenal site now. It wasn't always the case, but all information you want is there. And shout out to our sponsors, okay? You know, our sponsors do stuff for us. I'm gonna put some, some of their info in, in, in the chat. If, 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 if anybody's ever interested, our Platinum Sponsors has an awesome tool on doing retrospectives and then the silver sponsors there's Erin who's been part of of Agile Austin awesome for a long time she does add the Meliora coaching and then we have WellSky like online health company that's been a sponsor for a while and 321 gang to do a lot of safe agile transformations and stuff so please you know what if if there, there's anything you want to do in that space check our sponsors out we offer a lot of free content online. The meetups are all free. We have about five to seven every month. Like it's really extraordinary that Agile organization can like put out that many sessions per month. All our sessions are recorded and put on our Aust Agile Austin YouTube channel. I would say that the best thing as I'm putting in the chat now, if people are interested to hear about these sessions in the future, just join our group on Meetup or even go subscribe to the YouTube channel, okay? All our, all our content is there for the last three, four years and you know hundreds of sessions are there and we will be posting this session there too. Not to spend too much time on the board and everything, Awesome to work with the folks on the board. I would say just board at agileaustin.org. If anybody wants to email us and tell us how great we are, just to share that, please do, okay? <laughs> but it's just awesome to be an organization that has a vision, a purpose, a board folks there to support us. And 
we're always looking for people that might be interested to volunteer. We have a few opportunities out there. I just put the link in the chat. Again, I'm just putting stuff out there in the chat, so it'll be there in the in the in the recording and folks are make aware of it. Today, we're gonna have a guided discussion with Josh. We'll talk about that like in a minute and get started. But I also want to do a shout out for March 3rd, we have Don Dawson, who does not come from the Agile community per se, much more of a coaching background and change transformational coaching, because what we've discovered that when you're trying to lead any kind of Agile transformation, you have to sometimes I'm being cheeky about it. You have to sometimes change the way you approach things, you know, from a waterfall traditional to maybe a more of like an iterative approach. And as, as easy as it is to say that in one phrase, that is a really big change for a lot of people. So she deeps, she like dives into like some of the subconscious change and other ways that can really help individuals and teams change and transform. Because as much as we want to train and get folks on board, people have to change the approach, the way they see things, the way they work. And that is a big ask. That is a really big ask for a lot of people. And with that, I'm just gonna drop that meetup that is already posted for March. Okay, and as I say, thanks for coming. We're going to transition over to our session today. It wouldn't be all that much of a session if people it did not show up. So thanks for coming out. Josh and I could still have a good time by ourselves, but you know, nice to share it <laughs> sometimes, right? Oh boy, oh boy. So let me bring up. Let me go into presentation mode. All of you can see this. So it's exciting. So some, sometimes we have a speaker and do more of a traditional approach of a speaker, having to share things like what Don is gonna do in March. And sometimes we mix it up a bit and we change it. So I'm really happy to have Josh here who's going to introduce himself so, as soon. And we're gonna have a guided discussion around the path from customer needs to delivering value. Of course, this topic could be days of speaking, <laughs> okay, from customer needs to delivering value. Hey, there's everything we could cover here. But Josh and I are gonna cover like two or three points and really deep dive on that. And if people wanna like, you know, make comments on the chat, raise their hands, chime in, let's make it as interactive as possible, okay? But mainly we're gonna stick to these two, three topics, okay? So before we even get into that, ooh, let's do a poll. Let's do a poll. This, may, this means that people get ready to actually click on something for once, okay? Just that is the amount of interaction that is needed. And this is a poll around your agile experience. Because sometimes it's interesting to know. I mean, some people have just heard about agile, but really haven't done it. They've worked on agile teams before, even for just a few months or a year. And then you get like years of experience, right? And then some people can actually teach it, right? So it's just good to get a feel about where people are at. So yes, we have uh, 24 of 32 people that have responded, keep on responding. We'll give it a few more seconds. Thank you, thank you. 27, 84% of people have responded. We're stopping in three, two, one, boom. And we hear I share the results. Woo. So look at that. So we have a lot more people that have a lot of experience. So great. Be people can chime in with stuff that they've learned, with stuff that they've trained and stuff. And that is like the 56%. And then in the middle, we've got a, a good chunk that have been at it for a few years and everything. So this kind of gives Josh and I a, an idea of where people are at. Okay. Cool, cool. So let's get straight into it. And Josh, please introduce yourself. Who are you, Josh? Yeah, first, I just want to say, Max, that was awesome doing not only the intro, but managing the chat and getting things in there in the slide. And uh, there, there's a lot of things that happen with that. So bravo on the facilitation, uh, doing both on the stage and the background work at the same time. So that takes skill. <laughs> Uh, I try my best. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, and thanks for inviting me. Uh, so I'm Josh Fryer. Um, I'm a, uh, 
uh, just starting on the left-hand side, I speak French and I speak Portuguese. Um, I, I've spent some time in the military as well. Um, and both my military experience and my experience with the Boy Scouts of America, now Scouts BSA, um, is where I really got my first um, tastes of agility without knowing that agility was a thing, right? It wasn't until later when I started working at Circe Dynix um, that I became a scrum master and, and really found that there was names to a lot of the things that I'd experienced um, previously. Um, and so, and I dove into it. Um, so I've been, been at a couple different places. Circe Dynix is a, is a small company in Utah that, uh, that works with um, libraries. Uh, so that was very rewarding, helping uh, support public libraries and learning more about the fascinating services that they provide to, uh, to communities. Um, so there's all I can say is support your library, right? Even if it's just simple things like having a library card, um, that's how they get funding. So if you don't want to see libraries disappear, just have a library card. Um, you know, that even that helps. Um, getting into, uh, spent, spent a fair bit of time out at USAA. Um, while I was there, I started my own side gig called Foundations First Coaching, uh, where I do um, a lot of uh, Gallup-centered um, Clifton Strengths coaching. Uh, and then I've recently moved over to Target, and I'm working as a product coach there. Um, so although that is where I am currently at, I do want to say that uh, just the legal disclaimer, my views are my own. They are not reflective of Target's official views. So there we go. We got that on the recording. That should be, that should make the lawyers happy. So <laughs> thanks, Max. Absolutely. So we got all the legal stuff out of the way and everything. Now, have you done, Josh? Yep, I'm. I'm I good did to go. not know. You see, this is what I love about connecting with people outside of work and having to learn just from the few times we meet at a conference. I didn't know you spoke French and Portuguese. You multilingual. You. I speak Italian fluently. Is my first language, and I thought I was way special for that. I'm special, just not as special as you when it comes to languages. Let's set that expectation correctly. <laughs> Max Acasi, you. Let's be quick about it. And I just want to say. I like to put down the companies that I've been at because it just shows that everything I've done is so enterprise wide, uh, wide. Like I've just worked with large enterprises. I've never worked with a company that has fewer than 10,000 10, people or something like that, you know? And sometimes just in the IT organization is 10,000. So all my experience comes from large enterprises. I wouldn't know what to do in a startup with only 20 people. Mm -hmm. Maybe I might love it. Maybe I might be like, ah, oh, this is insane. But uh, I like to call out 2007, right? Because in my whole like journey from Dell to GM to Whole Foods slash Amazon and now at PayPal, it was in 2007 that I started doing Agile as a scrum master and light bulbs just went off when certain things that I was able to do that I wasn't able to do before happened. And I'll speak a bit about that. It was 2007. So I've been on this journey for a long time. Oh my goodness. Yes, I'm I'm getting older, wiser. I mean wiser. Yes, exactly. Uh, as you see, I'm in, in Austin, Texas. I've been in Austin since 2001. And I speak at a lot of conferences, meetups, everything. I just love to get involved out there with folks and just do the Agile Austin stuff. I love it, yes. So our first question and topic for today, okay? is how many people between developer and customer, like between the people that do the work and the customer that gets an actual value from the work you do. And I just wanted to start off that I put this screenshot, I mean, the, this image specifically because Josh, sometimes there are so many barriers or the journey is in such a way that you can't even see the customer. You can't even see who the customer is. So this is what this is. There's just a lot of barriers. Someone is coding, someone is testing, someone is doing technical writing, whatever it is. And that customer or whatever the need is, is not even anywhere in view, right? I mean, talk to us, Josh, about where this has happened, your experiences. I think it's really nice to hear from people's experiences that when we talk about in Agile, the most important thing is adding value to a customer and end user. Well, let's start with that, how that can be challenging, right? Because of that scenario. 
Yeah. So I think through a lot here with, you know, it, it's not just about the, the product owner understanding their customer, right? Like, yes, they're maybe the voice of the customer, but again, that's already one layer of abstraction, right? Um, so I, I mentioned that I, that I speak multiple languages, uh, was in the military. And one of the things that was interesting, um, I had the opportunity to, to go to a humanitarian mission in Africa. And uh, we were doing some uh, medical work and I was there as, a, as an interpreter. And there was a local tribal dialect that got translated into, so it was called Berber, translated into Arabic, Arabic into French. And then my job was to translate it from French into English, right? So then the doctor could understand what the problem was. Then the doctor would give me, you know, ask me a question and I go from English into French, right? And it goes back through. So if anybody's ever played telephone before, we know that things get lost in translation. Now try playing telephone with four different languages, right? And, and it becomes comical, but also like sad and frustrating. And there's so much friction in that. And I think it, it's really, um, we see that in the business space too, right? Our developers can be very technical. Our customers, aren't always very technical and and how many you know how many hops do we have to go through before before our developers are are able to start understanding the customer how many layers of filtration and interpretation are happening before they get there and and josh i mean like if i just may chime in i was speaking with someone who was doing work in the IT space back in the 80s, okay? So, so I am, I've been around for quite a bit, but not that long, right? But what was interesting is that that individual shared with me something in which I really felt we have gone backwards in regards to, they said when they were a developer, coding in like very rudimentary programming languages and everything and all that, but they were in the same office right by the salespeople right by the people that they were coding the software for. So they could just be asking questions and all of that. And they said, and now I've got portfolio IT road mapping. Mm -hmm. I've got all these business analysts and product people. And, and he's not like angry about it, but he's just saying before I would just speak to the person that I was doing the software for, because that was just like, you know, IT was an up and coming thing not big investment just have those developers and then work with them to build the software it was direct and he said that that was now there's just as it has become a bigger thing the investment in technology and larger organizations there are just more layers in between right that 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 happen and that is something that we've you know some things we progress and some things we move back right and i just I just wanted to make sure to have people included. Some people have made uh, comments here. Uh, Jeff Gritz, yeah, the whole I, group of BAs. Oh, sorry. You want to comment on, on a comment or what, Josh? Yeah, I, I saw I saw uh, Ratika's comment there about barriers in large organizations, right? And how they're more reachable in startups. And and I agree, right? I agree. It's easier in a startup. When I was in when I was at Circe Dynex, it's a company of uh, about three to 500 employees right? We worked with libraries and guess what? Our software engineers would go work in the library. They would volunteer in the library so that they were, you know, they're sitting there using the software to complete a job. And they're like, this sucks. I'm like, yeah, that's why they want a multi-select option, right? I want to select all. Well, how come we don't have select all? Well, because there's only five things in your test database. We've got a million and a half records in ours, right? Like, <laughs> <laughs> it's, I wanna... like, it's not that hard, but I didn't know that this was up your problem. Right. I didn't know that this is what you're trying to solve. Like we're like putting all this awesome functionality out and you actually just needed this. Right. Like, to do yeah. your work better. <laughs> but then, but getting to, to that comment of it, they're more reachable in startups, but then as leaders, what is our role in making them more reachable in the larger organizations? Right. And I saw I saw um, uh, uh, an organization do a really good job with this. It's Frost Bank here in San Antonio. Their, their headquarters are here and they ran a hackathon. And the hackathon was not just like a two day event. 
right? Their hackathon took almost a quarter. And, and because of that, right, it was spaced out, but there was intentional training that led up to the two to three day event where everybody's coding, right? But the, the agile coaches and the, and the scrum masters and the leaders were taking time out of their day to do training. And one of those things was around customer interviews. Because as part of the hackathon, when they kicked off the hackathon, they had to run multiple sprints and they had to talk about that, what, how they responded to user feedback. And so when that hackathon hit, there were engineers leaving the headquarters building, going to Frostbank, um, Frostbank branches. And they're talking with people as they're coming in and out. They're like flagging people down as they leave the drive through ATM. They're like, hey, 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 hey. You know, people are like, am I getting robbed? You know, like, so they, they had to figure out some of that stuff too. But, um, but yeah, they were out, they went out to the shopping mall. Like, hey, have you, you know, if, if you were to look Did at this mobile this banking app, yeah, yeah how Great would you question. do this? You know, and, and they were doing things. They had, you know, diagrams on paper, click, you know, click the button now next screen. And they learned things and they had to come back and then iterate on what they learned. And it was not common for them to do it. Right. But as developers, they learned a new skill. Right. But also beyond just learning a new skill, which they may not be super proficient at, they had a shared experience as an organization they all now understood the value of talking directly to their customer in a way that a training class, you know, can never really fully deliver. Bingo. I, that was a perfect story, Josh, to share because the, and the words of shared experience, right? And sometimes I hear, I mean, I hear what the folks say about it's easier at startups than in like an enterprise, yes, but we can still do it at an enterprise level. It's just, we have to put more work into it. And that's something that you have to be aware because at the end of the day, the goal is not to be more agile as much as I love agile. And yes, I want to be more agile. The ultimate goal is to deliver value. Okay, I've seen teams that say, oh, we're, we're sprinting better. We're doing this. Our burn downs look great. And, and that's all great. But, you know, let's talk about customer value that you're delivering. Have you found ways to, like, understand how much value you're delivering and to measure that and everything? And that sometimes gets lost. But when you have a shared experience, when you really put develop, like, people that are doing the work in touch with with the customers things happen things happen now who else made a comment maybe thanks josh for helping me out with the comments because we want to get people and folks if you want to come on off mute and just say something very quick you're more than welcome okay let's see uh i've coached with teams who didn't know who their customer were yes that's happened a lot kim do you want to speak to that oh sorry like you're eating or or can you no no i'm um, I'm like trying to have lunch. Um, <laughs> Take your time. You, know, you see, I'm in the kitchen. Uh, <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, I've gone into scenarios where I've started coaching with teams and they didn't even know who their customer was. And so it's like, okay, so how can we find that out? <laughs> you know, like, I just have a story. I have a backlog. I just, <laughs> that's what I'm doing. Right. And, and, and it's like, it's, it was really important. I had one group that, they like didn't even know how what they were doing was being used by anyone. Imagine and I'm that. like, what? <laughs> right, so where's the motivation? Why am I coming to work every day? Like paycheck is, is this much motivation, right? Yes. We have our bills and whatnot, but it's like not gonna be innovative, not gonna be collaborating, not gonna, you know? So yeah. it's like, all right, let's start tracking this down. <laughs> you know, and unfortunately the product owner didn't know either. The product owner was like, I have the backlog, I have the stories. And I'm like, and I was asked to do this. Like that was, was asked, I'm like, oh, okay. That actually happens. And as you said, Kim, then paycheck is I mean, the motivation. Well, you might get offered a 10% higher paycheck or 20% higher. And that's what's going to drive, I mean, your motivation somewhere else, right? Like you want to create teams that are empowered and are connected to some kind of a purpose and a value that they that deliver. Absolutely. Well, and, and, and plus to add on to what you just said is right, is 
if they don't know who's using it and why they're using it, when they're coding a lot of times or, or developing, I've worked with you know, non-IT folks, right? When, you're, when you come to like, well, I can do it this way or I can do it this way, knowing the end customer, it's like, oh, I should really do it this way because this is gonna, you know, this is gonna help them more or this is gonna lead exactly. to these other pieces that they probably want. And right, so they're doing a better product, and the and it's right providing, like you were saying, better value. So, absolutely, and I, this is a big deal, right? Big deal. Yes, Joss. As we close up on this topic, yeah. yeah um, one of the things again. that I like about this is getting into the uh, on that motivation, right? Why do we have teams? Do we have teams to build stuff, or do we have teams to solve problems? And if you don't know who's having a problem, then how well do you understand the problem and how good is your solution going to ultimately be, Yes. right? Yeah. And so uh, like Kim said, when I have a choice, do I have to run that through the chain and how many people to get back to the customer and then all the way back? Or can I just make the decision, right? Yes, yes. Oh my goodness. Again, a topic like that we could spend all day and speaking about yep. it. but due to the interest of time we yeah, uh, we just, just wanted to highlight it and yes kim i just wanted to share I did another this? comment in case people mm -hmm. missed it yes. in the chat um nordstrom innovations lab it's a six minute 39 second um oh, video which is really yeah. awesome which i show during product owner classes mm -hmm. and sometimes leadership classes as well but awesome. it's piggybacking on what josh shared as well so if anyone wants that as a reference for later oh. to watch it now um, awesome just wanted to share yeah. it and, and please like if you get a chance do you mind to post that on I mean, the meetup also right so the folks that oh. did not attend can see the comment right just like yeah. that i i love it i love it we're sharing information here we're sharing love of agile and best practices. So going on to our next topic, and I see that there were a few people that made some other comments. Thank you for the comments and all. We know that that is a very important topic. Might just have a presentation or speaker just on that in the future. But coming up here to time to feedback. When Josh said TTF, I it didn't even click to me. I'm like, oh, just another acronym. Oh, wait, hold on, what is it? Ah. I got to act as if I know this. I've been doing Agile for 15 years. I got to know that, but time to feedback. And it's funny that you brought this up because this is one of the most important things to me when I think of Agile, the best value that I've seen that I've gotten in teams that I work with get from Agile. It's not delivering things faster because you do it in increments. So you get the perception that people are delivering working software faster, but it's when an end user or customer uses that product, the service, and provide feedback. Or even if you go online and you monitor clicks or whatever, and you get feedback on how it is being used, that is one of the most powerful things because then you quickly, with quick feedback looks, you quickly integrate that feedback, if you're doing it the right way, because it's not easy, quickly integrate that feedback into your next iteration or planning session and everything. And so all of a sudden you're building, to Josh's point, you're not just building a product, you're, you're building something that is more aligned with customer feedback and needs in mind. And so you actually could waste so much time building stuff that is not used. I, I've got so many stories in regards to that, but when you actually build based on feedback, something happens something happens it's used more you like you you practice that skill set of not just even waiting for the feedback but with the gazillion monitoring tools we have on sites if you're deploying some kind of a customer facing site you don't have to wait for feedback you will know that same day if people are actually clicking through the app and doing the transaction the purchase or if they like drop off at click number three because we live in an Amazon world now and two clicks and a package is outside my door. So don't let me go to three or four clicks because I, I can't be bothered. That's, that's how it is sometimes, right? It's just the world we live in. But uh, Josh, time to feedback. Let's double click on this. Hey, okay? talk about it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so this is something that I heard uh, once upon a time and I don't remember who, who it was that I heard it from, but they were talking about how do we measure success? 
of an agile transformation, right? Or how do we know that we're moving the needle on agility, right? And this was one of the, the metrics that they started looking at was time to feedback, right? Because it doesn't, it doesn't matter how fast we can push stuff out if nobody uses it or if they hate it. You just right? deliver crap faster. That's it. That's the only thing. Right. And so that gets Look us into, into our vanity metrics, yeah. right? And so I'd like, just for everybody, I'd like to try something in the chat, right? Um, without, without sending the message, I'd like you to take, take 10, 15 seconds and think about how long does it take for feedback to reach a team in your organization today, right? Just think about that for 10 to 15 seconds, type it into the chat, but do not send it. I'm so test I'm tempted to type it out. Hold it. <laughs> all right. So now in about three seconds, I'm gonna have you all send at the same time. So ready? Three, two, one, send what you've got in the chat. All right. I see weeks, months, days, right? Easy, too long. Six months. <laughs> right? Yeah. I love it. All right. <clears throat> yeah. All right, so, so if we think about this, right, from an agility perspective, right, some of this time to feedback is directly, you know, may be directly related to how many people are between the customer and the developers, right? But some of it might also be, we're not even looking for feedback. So don't, so don't pretend that it's just one thing, right? It's, yeah, we can go check all of the clicks, right? But are we? I mean, imagine the value What's the motivation. <laughs> yeah. Um, imagine the value that an organization or a team would would reap if they release three days before the end of the sprint, they track the usage for, for two and a half days. Wow. And in the sprint review meeting with their wow. stakeholders, they say, we release this thing. And here's the, the early responses from our customers. Yeah. Now, do we want to like this is how we think it's going, right? Great if we've had an interview or not, but at least you've got some level of user usage yes. feedback, right? Do we want to keep investing in this? Do we want to pivot? Do we want to put this on hold? And we're not going to work on it at all next sprint because we want to do more customer interviews. We're going to start working on something else while we refine what it is we're doing with this feature set, right? Like all of a sudden now our review meeting is no longer a presentation and this is done and like thanks this you know this meeting could have been an email just mail me the deck right <laughs> it's it's now a collaborative working session and not only have we received feedback but we're we're making decisions based on that feedback we're implementing feedback right um and and that's like that's true agility mm -hmm. right so. and that's a mindset like, to me I really think that that's a mindset shift. Like mm -hmm. the, the, the mindset shift, for, it's not enough. And I know it's hard for a lot of people to hear this. It's not enough to just deliver, right? Is that, but, but that's our whole goal, deliver, get done with the sprint. And that, yes, that's a big part of it, but it's not a, like, we've got to understand is what we're delivering adding value. And this is just part of the whole conversation capturing the feedback, seeing about it. And teams can proactively do stuff themselves if they're customer facing and have all those tools in place. But Josh, do you know what I did? What I helped spearhead? It was back at Whole Foods. So it was about three years back or something like that. And it was awesome. It was the fact that when these large programs get deployed, sometimes they just get deployed, they're on the site, and there's all these thank you emails and congratulate emails, and everybody replies to them, great job, great job, great job, and then that's it. We go on to something else, right? And it's just like, you just get this feeling that people are just doing all this work, and it just goes into a black hole, right? And whatever. I got some of the product leaders to come and share data like we did an all hands kind of thing and they shared data and they even did a bit of a working uh, demo about look at what it was how hard it was for people to find our stores and find things when we didn't have google search integrated into it and now look at all the features and it was awesome for everybody just to hear 
from people more on the business side, people closer to the customer. Thanks to your help, we were able to do this and this and this and actually show a demo of it, show the data, show the data that before people would drop off the transaction at eight clicks. Now that we're down to three clicks, our percentage transaction completion has increased. And, you know, just to show like raw data, it was awesome because then all of a sudden, you have people that are in the trenches, whether they're developing, they're creating unit testing, script automation, all this stuff. All of a sudden they see like it connect to a purpose. It connects to a larger purpose of what I do, what other people in my organization do makes our online applications like work better and customers use them more. Like it's just all of a sudden it's real, it's real. Mm -hmm. But, but that took work to actually say to the folks in the product side, the folks in the business, we would like for you to come and present this. When can it work for you? Here's what we'd like you, because at first they're like, what do you want us to present? Okay, so I'm like, how about you focus on this? Like, I thought that just by saying, tell us how our products add value and our enhancers make value, they would have like a, but you know, they even had to think about it. Oh, let me see what best to share. But when they did it, it was like, wow. It was like, wow, it was awesome. And we do this on a quarterly basis, right? So it's just an all hands talking about customer value. That's it, right? Right. And, and you're, and it sounds like you're talking like, it's almost a scaled version of that feedback, right? Because quarterly, yes, right? Quarterly, yeah. Again, time to feedback quarterly, cool. but is that no, is that a short right. enough horizon for us to make changes or is that a okay we're re we're realigning to our vision we're making sure we don't drift too far these are the things that are successful this is this, these are the pivots that we've made right because at an individual team basis we're we're constantly adjusting yes oh no yeah right? josh like you were talking more at the adjusting team kind of like mm -hmm. tier, I was talking more like from an organizational yep. perspective, even if people did not do the work, it's good to hear what your organization as a yep. whole, your organization of like 450 people is yep. doing. And it makes you feel like I'm part of something, you know, I'm part of something that does this for our customers, right? It's more of a, you know, rallying thing. And, but still it's a feedback from people that you deliver stuff for. Right. right. Well, and you, you find that, that belonging in the larger Bingo. system, right? Bingo. This is how my piece integrates in. Even if I don't understand all of the direct ties, I can see what's happening, right? And there is that, there is an element of motivation there, right? I think yes. I brought oh. that up earlier. What's the motivator? My paycheck is, is this much. <laughs> Or should be this much. If my paycheck is is ninety percent of my motivation for being it's at work, gonna... man. <laughs> and and Josh, we have both worked with people whose that was the motivation paycheck. And I'm telling you, it's like, oh my goodness, is this person ever going to think outside the box? Oh my goodness, is this person ever going to be more collaborative about this hackathon we're doing? Oh my, mm -hmm. like it's just tough. It's tough because yeah. those people just people will just do what they have to do, and that's it. Well, Don't think, and you have to think outside the box. You right. have to leverage all this AI automation that is coming at us and see what can I do to do more with like the same amount of time that I had. And you could probably do 10X if you have the motivation to right. really think. If you don't, AI might just, someone else that is using AI might take your job, right? Or right. you know, might disrupt you, and that's it. And we don't. Well, and and when we think about that motivation, and and I see Kim's hand, so I want to give yeah. her a chance too. But um, like as we get into that motivation aspect, and, and I know this is a leadership group, right? What is the leader's role in making sure that that you know is that are they only ten percent motivated by what the org does because they don't really understand yeah. what the org does, Bingo. right? And and how much of that is on them, and how much of that is on the leaders? Right. And so, Max, to your point, right, that large town hall where we're getting everybody together and we're saying this is the impact we're having. Right. And maybe that 10 percent motivation increases to 12 or 15 yeah. percent. Right. And then next time, like their thing is is what's highlighted. And now it goes from 15 to 25. Yeah. Right. Like it's we as deal. leaders can make a difference in that. Not saying we're reducing their pay. We're just reducing how much the pay is motivating them. 
Bingo. Because now they're engaged in their work, right? Yes. Um, Engagement, oh. key. Yeah. Kim, Kim, yes, please switch to you. I saw I you put stuff in the chat. Gonna... <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not actually even talking about that. But, you know, motivation, I'm thinking of, right, Dan Pink's drive. And there's a great 10 minute video, which is also great to show to leaders and other people, right? So just in case people aren't aware of that, is that right? He's like, take money out of the equation because, right, all the people who will go volunteer on weekends, all the people who, like coders that are keeping Linux of, alive and yep. all of that, right? They are choosing to do that on their own time and they are not paid for that. So, and right? The products account, work you know, well. There's, there's a lot of other different folks out there talking about different things of motivation and pros and cons of Dan Pink, but it's a great starting point, right? Autonomy, mastery, and purpose. Mm -hmm. And the, the money should not be in the equation anymore. Pay them what they're worth. And then, then it's the other things of we're acknowledging you for what you bring to the table. We're showing how you fit in. We're celebrating, you know, all the successes, that type of thing. We're supporting you in your continued growth. Uh, because people do want to grow and learn in different ways. Yes. Um, so definitely wanting to make sure that gets, oh, that gets absolutely. added in because, because really, you know, some of Dan Pink's stuff shows, right. That besides, um, jobs where you actually have to use kind of your frontal cortex Yes. jobs. I forget how he actually says it. I'm knowledge reading, I'm, like, I'm reading the book thinking fast things yeah, well, right now on neuroscience so that's my brain going but yeah right if, if you're having to use your frontal cortex if you give people actually raises and promotions and bonuses their actual productivity goes down and he has to list the science on that it's it's not just they've done studies yeah. right exactly so there's science and i'm a former electrical engineer i like the data you know and <laughs> he's not just speaking out of his butt but right so it, it's the it's 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 the what what is going to motivate you is it motivating yes. you to we did a great job and now you know like when i uh, had colleagues at rally software before it was all the things it is today right eight hours a month a month they were allowed to volunteer at the place of their choice and they were paid for that work day yeah because they understood that this actually helps them yes on the other time that they're at work have that extra umph the extra umph and now that extra engagement from us that are trying to always lead agile transformations or trying to learn better how to lead the agile transformation that extra engagement empowerment makes a difference it makes a difference it can really be a game changer right and and thanks for sharing the drive if you look here i have been here i've only read this portion for like seven years so now you have empowered me i even put it on my desk just recently to read the rest of it he he goes into a lot of statistics it gets really deep and everything but i love it like how to intrinsically motivate people this is part of agile transformation also and he yeah. has a great 10 minute video that they've put um um graphics with i forget the term yeah. so it's really easy to watch and, and, and listen to it's very yes. engaging and especially with leaders who don't have a lot of time it's great to have it queued up on your laptop go into their office for your meeting with them coaching with them and go just like fire it up this, just watch it and then you can like discuss right because it's quick yeah. 10 minutes even if you only have 15 minutes with them yeah so, but uh, before I show them the video, I'll tell them, disclosure, if you do want to pay me more or give me a higher bonus, that's okay. I'm still going to be motivated. I'm still going to be, I know that Daniel, he said something else about that, but I still would be motivated if you pay me 20% more. It's yeah. okay. Because that's not, as long as you pay people where they're comfortable, it's great, but I'm going to be motivated regardless. So pay me more. It's okay. Kim, I'm joking. <laughs> Thank you. Folks, well, before we go on to the next topic, next and last topic, does anybody have a comment to say or anything on this? Oh, I, I see uh, Sade is uh, mentioning relatedness as another good motivator. And that makes just makes me think of uh, SCARF, the SCARF model, right? Um, by David Rock. So uh, I'll just, 
Uh, so that has to do with feedback and, and motivations, neurological responses a little bit in there too. So uh, uh, maybe anyway. if you could put that in either the, co- the uh, on I mean, the meetup comments, like some of the info, I think it's good to yeah. share that stuff afterwards. Uh, folks, this is always good. Third and last topic that we'll have time to discuss. I've never heard about the scarf model. I really want to double click on that. That's what we say a lot. And that's the great thing about these sessions. You leave with learning one thing, even if that value with learning one thing new. Uh, prioritization. Again, another topic that when Josh and I started to talk, it was like, not only is it like, ah, uh, very important. It's something that presently now at PayPal, we are really trying to emphasize with our project management office, our product organization, a lot of people that are uh, really involved in the roadmap portfolio planning, right? When you have a lot of big enterprises that plan, I actually copied and pasted something from one of our PowerPoint slides because there's all this annual roadmap planning and it's great to have a North Star. It's great to say as an organization for the next two, three years, we are going to enhance our checkout like the process, streamline it because, you know, check out the PayPal is like search to Google and blah. And so you have the, and then you have all these initiatives on the checkout, like fewer clicks for people to check out on, on the platform, blah, blah, blah. But then that's great. But then you have to prioritize the initiatives because people can't do everything at once. And so then we try to break things down into our quarters and we use Jira. So the epics, we're trying to identify high priority epics for each quarter so that we at least teams can know even if they work in a very sprint by sprint uh i'm like an incremental approach i'm like an iterative approach know that this is what you're doing for the next few months can help people focus because if you don't get people to focus on work it is incredible josh how non-critical busy work just shows up in the backlog it just shows up. I cannot, I cannot believe it. Like, you know, there's someone here on the Zoom, Brian Tweet. He works at, at, at I'm at PayPal also. And he's an agile coach on my team. And he'll go to, he'll work with teams and he'll be like, hey, Brian, you, you can speak to it too. He'll see stories in the backlog and he'll be like, what's this for? What's it just like randomly? And Brian, what answers do you get when, you know, you just see random stuff that show backlog that are not linked to priority epics or work that we've committed to, to uh, the business? What answers yeah, do you it, get? It, right? it, we definitely have some challenges there where we're, we're working through is, is to try to keep teams really laser focused on what we're, we've committed to and call those out. And, and, and a lot of times it's like, well, we need to do this, but yet we don't have the epic created yet. I was like, well, then why do we need to do it if it's important we should have the the trail created ahead of time rather than because what happens is we wind up doing the work it gets linked to some other epic we forget to go and relink it uh it's to not the correct high epic, priority. And then, then that it's that not- work is missed right it's, it's lost and so yeah it's just it's just about discipline getting discipline within the teams to really work with the the priorities that we set and and keeping those priorities and calling it out when we're going to miss that as quickly as possible. Yeah. And, and it's, you know, I like to say I'm tool agnostic always. However, like when you're working with people that you don't even see, right? Like you're not in the office, you're working from home. It's a virtual world. You need something, you need like your tools to keep you focused on the right work, right? So we have all, we're trying to get all the product, PMO, all these people to say, you know, okay, you might've sent out a PowerPoint deck. You might've sent out an Excel spreadsheet, but we have to be laser focused on what we want to. And the only way is you've got to prioritize certain work and say, let's get this done first, right? And it's just incredible what a challenge it is. And you have to prioritize it various tiers, right? At the annual tier, the quarterly tier, sprint tier. Like, Josh, have you ever experienced this challenge? Or is it just me and Brian and a few folks that have experienced like this this thing about prioritizing work and laser focus on it? Yeah. I, I actually was as as you guys were talking about it, I was picking up a couple of words, right? And I heard I heard focus. 
many times, right? I heard commitment a couple of times. And, and when we're talking about prioritization, I also think about courage, right? Because prioritization means saying no. It doesn't mean saying yes, right? Yeah. Um, and, and when we go into the, those, those scrum values, right? The, the, those, are, those are three of them that we're looking at. And, and that when we talk about the importance of those things and, and one of the, the interesting struggles that I I've seen organizations go through and, um, yeah, at seriously Dynex, like I was, I was a greenie scrum master. And so I kind of like watched it change. I wasn't involved in the change, but I saw the power of it when they went from doing these annual roadmaps to, they actually moved to, um, what I later learned was called an intention map. And so they, they weren't talking about like this quarter, next quarter, the quarter after that, right? Um, and, and breaking it out and saying, this is what we're going to do this year. But they broke it into three categories. They said, this is what we're doing now. This is what we're going to do next. And this is what we're going to do later. Like, we know that people are asking for it. We know that you want it. But we're t- like, we're being honest. Like, we put it in the backlog. But it's. It's not now. We're not working on all the things now, right? And it, it created a level of focus, but also allowed for flexibility because we're in this now space and we might be working, we're not working on all of them at the same time, but from iteration to iteration, we might change which of these we're working on based on allowing ourselves to get feedback, um, you know, iterating through, uh, you know, they're working with some of their cross-functional bottlenecks as well, right? How do I get my mock-ups in time? You know, I mean, they're going through a transformation as well, but, um, and so for me, like I saw that change and I was like, this just makes sense. Yeah. And then um, when I went to USAA, they were not doing, they were doing annual roadmaps, right? And it's date driven. And once a roadmap gets out there, <laughs> heaven forbid, <laughs> you want to change it's going it. to change, right? And, oh, God. <laughs> and, and now I'm out at Target and they're doing these, these intention maps. And that's almost the default, right? Yeah. In, in, at least in the tech space. And we're, we're doing more outside of tech now, but um, they're doing a lot more of these intention maps where it's saying, this is, we know this is important right now. We're creating an intentional focus, yes. but also, and this is, I think that agility shift for leaders is they recognize our annual roadmap is just a best guess or a, a, a false hope, a wish, right? Because our world changes so fast. We want to respond to that feedback that the thing that we said today is going to be important and we're going to do it six months from now, like we might not ever do it. Right. And that, that's only six months, let alone all the work we put into planning that back half. So let's just like, we want that directionality. We want to have an idea of where we're going. Bingo. Right. But, and, and we're prioritizing the direction, which way are we going? We're going Northeast. Now, are we taking a heading at 73 degrees? Like, no. No, right, but you know that it really helps for people that have to do the work or people that have to drive or whatever say we're gonna be heading northeast how you get there you know by car by train like you sort it out right what's the best way that you get there but this is the what this is the why and figure out the how right and and then you keep people focused it's funny how many times it's, we're now saying laser focus josh we stepped that up a notch because you know <laughs> focus was just not cutting it apparently so now we've like transformed everything because yeah. we're saying laser focus and once okay. lasers get involved it's serious right? it's serious <laughs> exactly. hey i want to add one real quick one thing that's been a game changer for us is we've included in our backlog refinement meetings an epic refinement meeting and and that, so you take about the first 15 minutes of your backlog refinement meeting, and you're going to look at all the epics that are that are in progress and that we've committed to, and are they still on track? Are we missing any stories? Is there a story in the backlog that got missed that doesn't support the date that we're trying to reach? So kind of just taking that 15, 20 minute of that meeting uh, should getting those stories into your backlog uh, in your future sprints, that way you know your your next sprints are planned appropriately to your committed dates yeah and brian thanks for short, sharing that because that's an actual practice that the agile coaches brought to the table it shows the value of the agile yeah. coaches even by saying 
if we do this, this epic refinement, you brand it, it's very easy to understand. People will get in the habit to say, oh, here are two, three epics for the next two months. Let's make sure that, you know, the, the epic we're doing now, we actually have all the work cut, cut, cut out for that. And that avoids those rogue random stories. Mm -hmm. They just show up. I still don't understand how they show up. <laughs> they just show up in the backlog. <laughs> like some manager spoke to someone who spoke to a product manager. Like, well, however they show up, that's going to like limit the random work that comes in. Absolutely. Well, and I think about like, what are the heuristics we can use, right? And we can use that like no surprises, right? Our yeah. backlog has no surprises. Our sprint backlog has no surprises. Does that mean that we don't change anything? No, but it means when we change, we're communicating. We're proactively Bingo. communicating, right? Bingo. Rogue work, like stuff's gonna come in, but you know what? We wanna make that decision and we don't want someone else to show up and be like, wait, where did this come from, right? Bingo. It's They Bingo. know where it came from, mm -hmm. right? And and surprisingly, that is, that is a problem. And it's not just a problem now, it's been just a problem in the past. And the unfortunate thing I'll conclude with is that then people are forced to work nights and weekends to finish the actual work that was committed to, but it didn't get done because random work showed up, right? That's the unfortunate thing. It takes, it takes away the focus that people should have on the actual work committed. And that is painful to see people have to work more when if we could have just said, let's be disciplined. An agile team is a disciplined team, okay? Be disciplined about how you take in the work. It can actually make you work less. Right. It can make you do your 40 hours a week and that's it more effectively. Right? Well, Folks. With two minutes to go, <laughs> as much fun as this is, we got to conclude. We got to conclude. So I would say, Jeff, what last closing phrase conclusion? It could be have a happy Friday. It could be I'm having fun to see the sun this weekend. What would you like to conclude this uh, guided discussion with from what we talked about or in general? Man, now you stumped me. You stumped okay, me on the okay, last well, question. If I go first, I'll give go it for it. Go for it. I I just want to say it's awesome to come together and talk about what really matters from customer needs to delivering value. Because at the end of the day, what I like about Agile, which is not just lean where it's focused on waste management and to I'm like eliminate the waste or some other things. It's like focus on collaboration, having to work in a more humane way to deliver customer value faster and better. That's it. So we just have to go back to that as much as possible. I know there are a lot of cool frameworks. There are a lot of cool things out there, but we just have to make sure how can we empower people to really make them step up, to really take it to the next level in understanding those customer needs and having to meet them. Whatever way you do it, there's a million ways to do it, just find a way to do it. Because when the disruption, and it's coming, of AI arrives, the people that understand their customers better, the people that know what value they have to deliver can use AI and automation to get that done even faster because they're already there mindset. They're not just coding Java and having to wait for a story because that might be something that could be automated. Switching over to Josh real quick, closing right. statement. My thought, closing statement, uh, as, as we go forward into the product space as leaders, fight the fight with a friend, right? That's going to be important, having, having your friend. So fight the fight with your friend. Can you be my friend, Josh? Can you be my friend, Josh? <laughs> I need as many friends as I can have because this, this fight has been going for 15 years. And you're asking <laughs> right in front of Brian? I mean, come on. Come no, on. no, Brian's Brian. already my friend. No, no, okay. like, okay. I need more friends. I need as many okay. as possible. <laughs> Folks, thank you, Josh. Thank you for joining us today. Yeah. It's been thank awesome, you. Josh, as always. Thank you, everybody, the 35 plus people that joined. Kim, Brian, everybody that commented and stuff. We will be posting the YouTube link in the comments and 
Feel free to post more stuff in the comments. And next time we meet is March 3rd. Stay safe, stay agile, my friends. Okay. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Bye, folks. Take care.